Hello, my name is Dominic Angelillo. I'm a professor of medicine and interventional cardiologist at the University of Florida in Jacksonville. We're here at the ESC live in uh, uh, Barcelona, and I'm joined by uh, Christoph Varnhoff, associate professor of cardiology and interventional cardiologist from uh, Sweden. So thanks for joining me. Thank you, Dominic. So a uh, lot of interesting news here at the, uh, at the ESC. Uh, and in particular, some new insights from uh, the landmark uh, Pegasus trial. So before we get into some of the details of this new information, can you just give me a quick uh, overview of the Pegasus trial? Yes, the, the Pegasus TIMI-54 trial was a trial testing long-term treatment with Ticagla together with aspirin in comparison to only aspirin in patients with uh, re recent MI within one to three years uh, uh, before randomization in the trial. And the trial tested two doses of, of Ticagular, 60 milligram and the 90 milligram dose by daily, and showed a 15 or 16 percent relative risk reduction of the primary endpoint over three years of cardiovascular death, MI, and stroke. Very good. Now, this did come with a price. Of course. Okay. Yes, it does. And the trial also showed an increase in, in TIMI major bleeds. Fortunately, there were no increase in fatal bleeds or intracranial hemorrhage. That's a good, good question. Now, also within the trial, I think it's important to uh, emphasize these were not just all patients who had an MI, but there were some enrichment factors, right? These were patients who had to be above a certain age, above the age of 65, have diabetes, CKD, correct? And multivalent disease. Multi -disease yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so that is important. It was a subset of MI patient at a high risk that very, were enriched in the trial. That's very important to, to emphasize. Very good. So um, at this meeting, uh, there were some new insights uh, from uh, the trial. Uh, the European Medical Agency uh, specifically requested that uh, analysis be performed to try to identify the ideal population in whom to apply the 60 milligram dose, which ultimately was the winner in yes. this trial. Yes, that's true. We already know from, from the trial that the patients that seemed benefit the most was the patients with not a two distance MI, uh, those with an MI within two years, and also those patients that did not have a long interruption of dual antiplatelet treatment for their initial MI, so that didn't have a cessation of, of, of more than one year, so less than one year. Those seem to be those patients with the greatest benefit. And those were the questions that the EMAI also put us, or, or put the scientific community, to show uh, could there be uh, benefit, especially in this population, and how does that look? Which ultimately, it makes sense uh, in clinical practice, right? You would probably think about uh, continuing uh, a treatment or prolonging therapy in that specific uh, patient population. So great, so what did the data show? Well, the data showed when, when studying the subpopulation of patients with either a more recent MI, up to two years, or a discontinuation of less than one year of the prior dual antiplatelet treatment, there was a relative risk reduction of the primary composite endpoint in this population uh, of cardiovascular death, MI and stroke, of around uh, 20%. And importantly, cardiovascular mortality was uh, reduced by 29% relatively over three years in this population. Okay, well, that's, that's uh, great information. So essentially, uh, the analysis uh, identified, a, let's put it this way, a higher risk cohort, if, if you will, uh, around 10,000 patients. And so what we see, consistent data with the overall trial, but a greater magnitude of, of benefit because of the type of population uh, that we're seeing. So uh, we have this, this new data. Um, we have the European label. Yes. Uh, what does this mean uh, for practices in Europe in general, and what does it mean for your practice? I think this, this aids the, the, the practitioner when, when choosing patients for prolonged uh, treatment. There's always, of course, an offset with bleeding and reassuring from, from, from this analysis, bleeding was, was similar or lower to that of the main analysis, but again, with an increased risk of, of timid bleeds, timid major bleeds, but no increased risk of fatal bleeds and, and intracranial hemorrhage. And again, this analysis was performed in the 60 milligram dose, and that is the dose that is approved 
But of course, there's always an offset with, with bleedings when protecting patients of ischemic events. And I think this, this analysis helps a lot to select the, the patient populations where, where we should and can consider a prolonged uh, dual antipater treatment with Ticagra 60 milligrams. Well, very good. And you, I think you used the correct term. And this label uh, aids and helps the physician in the, the uh, decision making because correctly, as we mentioned before, uh, prolonging therapy beyond one year in the post in my patients, not for all patients, no. uh, but we're identifying the patients uh, within the, uh, first of all, higher risk category. And then within that higher risk category, this analysis teases thing out pretty well. And I would say the reduction in cardiovascular mortality uh, is something that we're not so used to seeing no. in clinical trials. I so uh, definitely something that um, uh, in European practice, having this dedicated label uh, should be of great uh, benefit. Yeah. Well, uh, why don't you just give me an example of a, of a patient in your clinical practice where you would uh, apply uh, this new uh, uh, European label insight? Yeah, I think it's 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 a great example of that patients that maybe not have the classical risk characteristics for a stent-related problem, because we know from Pegasus that we mainly affect spontaneous infarctions. But I think these, these patients exist. We know that we have patients with multivessel disease where there is still uh, coronary artery disease present also after stenting, after the period when we protected the stent. And of course, the patients with, with comorbidities such as diabetes and, and a reduction in, in kidney function. So that would be the classical patient in my clinic and maybe even more so for the younger patients where calculating a precise DAP to DAP score as the novel DAP guidelines would recommend would uh, give us a hint at that we might have a favorable situation uh, when it comes to long-term treatment regarding bleedings also. Very good. So it's a kind of a combination between uh, clinical judgment on one hand, integrated by some scoring system and some help from, from the label. So kind of putting it all together, yeah. uh, we can uh, uh, make uh, uh, our decision with our patient. Well, let me give you an example in my practice. We've been uh, using the 60 milligram uh, now for uh, more than a year, mm -hmm. um, we don't have uh, the label like in, in, in Europe, it's a little bit at the discretion of the, uh, the physician. Uh, and I can say that the label to a certain extent uh, applies to what I do in my practice, although um, I think that at the end of the day from a true practical standpoint, there's the decision-making process, which is at one year. And it's there where you decide and you sit down with the patient and have a conversation on whether to prolong or not. So uh, it's a little bit even more restrictive that's within the European label, which looks at the discontinuation up to one year. But if you look at another analysis from the Pegasus trial, if you look at the patients who had not discontinued or discontinued even within 30 days, there's a 27% relative risk yes. reduction. Yeah. And so that's kind of what I apply in my clinical practice. So uh, being here at the meeting uh, and looking at this data and presenting it as well, uh, people have asked me, you know, how does this European label apply to practice in the United States? I think it's very informative Yes. And as you mentioned, it's an aid for uh, uh, clinicians to keep in mind and showing the information, including the mortality benefit, uh, is obviously a striking with the understanding that uh, there's still uh, an increased risk of bleeding. But as we say in clinical trials and when we interpret results, uh, mortality trumps uh, uh, everything. So the uh, new guidelines uh, were just uh, uh, released. What do you think about... Uh, the data from Pegasus, the new label change, and the wording in the most recent DAPT guidelines. 
yeah, I think it's uh, I'm happy to see that they match each other very, very well, both the DAP guidelines and also the STEMA guidelines that were aligned for, for these two versions. And, and we can clearly see that, that there is a willing from, from, the, from the guideline orders to highlight exactly what you're mentioning right now, that we need to, to look into the individual patient, we need to inform the patient, and even more so for long-term DAP, involve the patient in the decision. And I think the new guidelines, they, they stress that to the greater extent that it did before, either by using risk scoring, but also looking at um, the historical year we just had after an ACS. How did my patient tolerate the treatment and, and uh, how is the patient willing to, to continue treatment after have given the information you just mentioned about the, the opportunity of or possibility of a mortality reduction, uh, of, of reducing spontaneous MIs mainly. Um, what I think also what was great with the new guidelines is to see that for prolonging treatment, we need to stress those other factors apart from those mainly being coupled to, to the intervention uh, for the ACS, but because it's not all about the stent anymore. Absolutely. It's all about, it's all about the patient. Yes. And, you know, what I typically uh, tell my patients, um, you can have the best angiographic result by putting in a stent, but... Uh, I always say putting a stent is almost putting in a patch. You're just yes. treating a very small portion of the entire vasculature. We're dealing with a systemic disease. And I like what you mentioned that within the guidelines, uh, 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 the wording is now uh, more transparent. It's clear. Yes. I mean, we still have the same uh, to be recommendation, uh, but they go a little bit more into specifics into the data from the Pegasus trial specifying the 60 milligram uh, BID uh, and how this can be preferred over uh, other therapies uh, which have not been studied as in the Pegasus, uh, uh, like in the Pegasus trial. Because there's a classical question that comes up, well, if you're using the 60 milligram BID, can't you just use clopidogrel, for example? But that was not tested in the trials, what I always try to, uh, to explain. And you also have a lot of experience with, uh, uh, with pharmacodynamics and platelet function. How does this 60 milligram work? Well, I, I think when we saw the, the data on the 60 milligram dose, which has been pulled from the, from, the, from, the other, from the randomized trials, we're happy to see that there seems to be a more consistency. Although, uh, as compared with 90 milligrams, uh, the variability is somewhat higher, but not at all to the extent that and as for clopidogrel and of course we don't have the problem of genetic interaction as well and that is, has been proven from from plato sub studies and onwards so so from my point of view and from my clinic when meeting the patients that is of course uh, reassuring mm -hmm. on long term how do you consider the bleeding risk and and the the opportunity of using proton pump inhibitors is, is that uh, routine in your clinic yeah so it's a good question you know in the past uh we used to uh uh, use proton pump inhibitors routinely in, in a lot of our PCI patients mm -hmm. until uh, a number of years ago, uh, there was a box warning for the drug interaction with, uh, uh, with clopidogrel and, and the new uh, updated guidelines saying that yeah. these should not be used routinely in everybody, but in more selected uh, uh, cases. Clearly, class one, if a patient had a bleeding event, class two, uh, if uh, the patient's at high risk for bleeding. Mm. But uh, with regards to the 60 milligram long term, and if I'm concerned about bleeding, mm. uh, I'm probably not going to try to protect it necessarily with a PPI okay. uh, because a lot of these patients, um, to a certain extent, they've already uh, proven themselves to be at low risk for bleeding mm. um, by one year. So if there's an indication to be on a PPI, then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll add it. It's very different than, for example, a patient with atrial fibrillation yes. that may be on triple therapy yeah. and, and, and will not. That's at least my, uh, my practice. Great. Very good. Well, this was a great discussion. Thanks. Um, I think that uh, time will tell uh, how uh, this, uh, this, uh, this data will be uh, used in, in, in clinical practice. A lot of great registries going on in Europe and uh, definitely in Sweden. Uh, nobody can beat you guys when it comes to uh, uh, performing registries, collecting data, and, and looking at clinical outcomes. And so it'll be very interesting to see how uh, this all plays out in a, a real-world uh, clinical practice. Uh, but I think that 
good data we have are a great asset to our, our patients, uh, important uh, to help guidance in our clinical practice. So great. thanks for having us. Thanks. And everybody, uh, thank you for joining us here from ESC in Barcelona and have a nice day. Have a nice day. Thank you.